Never since World War II have we faced a situation like this where we both can be part of this uh, battle, but must be part of this battle. This is bigger than all of us, and I am fully confident that Washingtonians will rise to this challenge to get back to a normal state of our life as soon as humanly possible. But all of us have to recognize for the next several weeks, normal is not in our game plan. This is the Frontline Dispatch. I'm Rainey Aronson, executive producer of Frontline. We are living in an unprecedented time. Stark headlines tell our top story again tonight. Bars and wineries and asking those 65 and older to self-isolate. Brutal day on Wall Street. The Dow sank nearly 3,000. 30-day restriction on non-essential President Trump is closing the border with Canada and calling himself a wartime president. Our daily lives are changing with dramatic speed in the midst of the coronavirus pandemic. There are so many questions, and right now it's difficult to know what will happen next. The lessons that have come out of here, where it, where it began, where it remains an epicenter of the disease, the lessons here are crucial. That's journalist and frontline correspondent Miles O'Brien. He's one of several journalists from the frontline team currently on the ground reporting this story for us. In the coming days, weeks, and months, you'll see reports from us on TV, online, and on this podcast. Miles is currently reporting from Washington State, where the first COVID-19 patient was identified in the U.S. The Frontline Dispatch is made possible by the Abrams Foundation commit its excellence in journalism, and by the WGBH Catalyst Fund. Okay, I have speed here. Do you want do you want to slate it in any way? or? Okay, all right. Great, okay. Okay. Miles, you're in Seattle. Tell me about it. Give us a picture of what it looks like and feels like there. You know, it reminds me of when I covered Hurricane Katrina back in 05. I remember, you know, driving into New Orleans the day before Katrina hit, and, you know, there's absolutely bumper-to-bumper traffic of people going out of the city, and we were alone on the road going in. And I'm thinking, there's, I've got to kind of wonder about your career choices at that point, right? And so here we were on this empty plane, arriving at this nearly empty airport, going to uh, the Hyatt Regency in Seattle, which is the largest hotel in the Northwest, and there were 12 rooms occupied, three of which uh, were us. And so then you go down to, you know, Pike Place and you go to, you know, they're, where they're normally tossing the fish and all that. None of that is happening. This is the time of year when people be just crowding that area in front of the original Starbucks with all the push carts. None of that is happening now. It's kind of got that, you know, almost expect to see the tumbleweeds rolling through the streets. You know, I think the, the uncertainty over the time frame just adds to the level of angst. There's a strong sense of resiliency, some personal pride of um, the location and and how they feel like they are getting through it, uh, doing things kind of on their own, improvising ways to live life. Uh, But then you scratch beneath that surface and there's a healthy dose of fear. People have Mm. been kind of robbed of their sense of optimism and their sense of planning for the future. And then you go one more layer down and you get into some anger. Uh, There's a lot of people without mentioning a lot of names, frankly. There's not a lot of finger pointing, but there's just a lot of anger and disappointment in the system which has led us to this point. Could we have done better? That question comes up a lot. So you um, went to Providence Hospital. I understand that's where the first U.S. coronavirus patient was treated. Yes. Um, Talk to me about just entering into that hospital. Take me there and your conversation with Dr. George Diaz. Yeah, this is, it's really interesting. Just um, two or three weeks before patient number one became, you know, one of his, they had done a extensive 40-person tabletop simulation of what to do, if, when, and how to approach it. And they went through every little step. And one of the things they decided was, you know, we have to build a temporary what they call a negative pressure wing, which means essentially that the pressure on the outside is higher than on the inside. So when you open the door, the air goes inward, not outward. You know, fairly much common sense there that keeps whatever contagion is on the inside in theory. So they literally had to build something for patient number one when they knew he was coming in. 
And they estimated in this simulation, it'll probably take two hours. In the real world, it took them two hours. And they literally put, built up makeshift walls and, and a system to, to keep that airflow in the proper direction. They, he, he said there was nothing that we had to improvise. We had it figured out. And I said, you know, you, uh, it's hard to imagine a, a facility that would be more prepared for this. He said, you know, they were, he was being humble about it, but the truth is it, there's no question that is the case. On top of that, they had built a relatively new facility, which was uh, primarily designed just as a post-surgical wing. But when they built it, it was right around the time uh, when it was immediately post Ebola concern. And so the decision was made at the time to make this normal wing also have the so-called negative pressure capability. So what they did was, once they realized we had patient number one, is that they knew there'd be a patient two, three, four, and onward, they cleared out that wing and turned it into a COVID-19 wing. So they had a lot of infrastructure kind of in place and a plan in place which, frankly, uh, that the, the hospital has been pretty much besieged by healthcare facilities all over the country wanting to know what the plan was and how to implement it because it's a, it's a great uh, model for, for how to do it. So uh, speaking of which, how are you keeping yourself safe? Talk a little bit about what you're doing out in the field right now. This is pretty unusual. I mean, you know, the whole idea when we're doing journalism and trying to film something is to get as close and intimate as possible. So how are you doing it to keep yourself safe? Well, first of all, we're, we're trying to um, keep ourselves sane and try to remind ourselves uh, constantly of what the statistical risks are. It's interesting the director of photography I'm with, was with me in the middle of the campfire in Paradise, California. We literally were surrounded by flames at one point. Not a smart thing to do, but there it happened. He told me yesterday that he felt he is more scared now than he was there. And I said, why do you say that? He said, because this is invisible. I don't know where it is. Right. I, I knew where the fire was. And it, it reminded me a lot of covering, you know, I've been to Fukushima, as you know, a half dozen times or so inside the exclusion zone. It's very similar to the fears that people have about radiation. It's invisible and it can kill you. And that's what we've got, invisible and can kill you. And there's something psychologically uh, pervasive about that. So we wash our hands a lot, uh, really a lot. When I went into the hospital, uh, they gave me a questionnaire about my potential exposures. They asked if I'd been on a plane in the past 14 days. And for me, that answer is always yes. And so I had to wear a mask there on the presumption that I might be carrying uh, the virus, not necessarily receiving it. You have to kind of take each of these things one at a time. If you start thinking about it, um, all of it at once, it, it can be a bit overwhelming. No, that makes sense. And of course, you have to keep the people you're talking to safe as well. So that's a whole other, you know, element to this that I can imagine is challenging. Yeah, I'm, yeah I don't want to be a vector, right? I mean, for all, the, the amount of time I'm on planes, for the, the amount of exposures that we have, I mean, doing what we do, we certainly are not sheltering in place. Um, I think... The, the mission that we have justifies what we do as long as we take a prudent approach to it. But I, I mean, I, I, I don't think I could, I don't think I could ever get over um, the, the, the feeling that I somehow made somebody sick as a result of this. And so I've been watching my own symptoms, if there are any. The other morning I woke up and I couldn't speak. And, you know, it, it, I thought, whoa, you know, that, that happens sometimes when you wake up and you're dehydrated or whatever. But I immediately went into panic mode and thought, oh my gosh, I'm going to be in the, I'm going to be in this, now doing this film like from this, this hotel now. in Seattle. <laughs> right. Everybody's if you wake this way, up right? And you sneeze, you feel that way. So no, that's understandable. So talk to me a little bit about, you know, you're a science reporter. What is surprising you that you're seeing? You read so much before you got there, you were prepared, but what is actually surprising you? Well, I had a really interesting talk today with the state's top epidemiologist, Scott Lindquist, really interesting person. And, you know, I was asking him a couple of things. You know, I said, you know, when, when the coronavirus first became evident in China, uh, surely you must have expected, you know, this tsunami was headed your way eventually. He said, of course. And we immediately began planning and uh, doing uh, all kinds of simulations with hospital experts, trying to come up with a plan they could pull off the shelf uh, when it happened, not if it happened. And what was kind of interesting about it, he said, you know, we believe the reason that patient number one for the United States 
came here and was here is because we were the most attuned to it. We were the people who were most ready to see it, to test for it. it. I hadn't thought about it in that direction. That's really surprising. So he's saying essentially because we knew about it, we tested for it, then of course we found out about it first. Exactly, and so my follow-up question was, well, do you think that there were other places that probably had their own patient one and might have had the first case if they were just looking? He said, of course. So it's, it's really interesting. This is a place uh, that I think stands in contrast to um, certainly what uh, the, the ethos uh, in Washington right now. They have embraced science. They've put science at the center of their policy. They have let kind of the data drive the decisions. And the point is, when science and facts dictate policy, the reaction is better. And, you know, people look at Seattle and say, well, they've got a much bigger problem there. Well, you could say they have a much bigger handle on a problem that might be bigger where you are. I think the biggest insight I take away from his interview, because he must have said it probably five times, because I was very curious about, you know, the testing problems and why it's been so difficult to get testing up and running. And he said, you know, as much as that we could have improved and been a little better on that, the real issue now is PPE, which is personal protection equipment. Uh, there, it doesn't matter how many tests there are if you don't have masks and these uh, visors and the garb and you know, the, the full suit for the medical personnel to wear to give the test. So he said, we are absolutely at the end of the line on supplies. He said, I am pleading for industry, for the private sector to ramp up production so that he can keep the testing going. It's, it's not so much about the tests, it's about the, the masks. That is fascinating. So it's no longer the, the tests in that situation, but rather keeping our, our healthcare professionals safe. Absolutely, yeah. What's happening is, uh, in the absence of industry producing enough of these things, there are employees of the Providence healthcare system here who have volunteered their time. They've gone to uh, craft stores, kind of bought out materials, and they're gathering together sewing circle style to make the equipment for their colleagues so they can do their job safely. And just a little while ago, I had the opportunity to see what they were doing and talk to them. All right, so we're walking in. Hey there, how are you? Did a TV crew come in here? Yes. Can, which way did they go? They went that away? Okay, thank you. All right, so we're inside the Holly Center here in Renton. Did you see a TV crew come by here by any chance? Yeah, hey, in there. Oh, oh here, we're here. Oh my gosh. All right, so I'm walking in this room. Looks like a big meeting room or conference room. There's probably one, two, three, four, five, six, probably 10 round tables. One, two, three, probably about a dozen people. And it, uh, Everybody has crafts. It looks like they bought out a Joanne's craft store. Hi, what's your name? I'm Karen. Hi, Karen. I'm Miles O'Brien, and we're, I'm doing a little podcast. How's it going so far? So far, it's great. We're, um, we're up to 250, how many? 252. 252. We're trying to get to 1,000 by tomorrow, um, and we're very excited to be chipping in. A thousand by tomorrow. You you guys are working hard. We're serious. Well, we need to work hard because our caregivers that are taking care of patients with COVID are working a heck of a lot harder than we are. Yeah. Are, now you guys are all volunteers, but employees of the system. Is that it? Yes. Yep. Right. Uh, right. I have two members from my team. We're in the population health division, so we support um, we support all of our regions across the system. But um, but today we're here doing this kind of support. So you know this is deadly serious business, right? What you're doing, but it, in a sense, is are you having fun? We've had a little bit of fun. We've had some tunes going. We've got snacks, so that's good. Um, yeah. What's the what's the long range goal? How many masks do you? I mean, do you, want, you have to keep delivering these things? We do, yeah. and we need to keep making them until our caregivers don't need them anymore. Until we have our supply chains uh, restored and able to provide the the protection that our caregivers need. So on the, on the one hand, you know, it's really cool that you're doing this. And on the other hand, it's really sad that you need to do it, right? Oh my gosh. 
much. It's so sad. So this very week, I was supposed to be in Guatemala working on a mission trip um, to construct and deliver wheelchairs to people from remote areas of Guatemala who don't have access to wheelchairs. So instead, I'm in the United States building protective equipment for our caregivers against a pandemic. So, think about that. yeah, I'm, I'm pondering <laughs> that for a moment. Yeah. I think you've made your point. I think so. Go ahead and put a fine point on it. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I think it's it's just, it, it shows how interconnected things are in the world. And, you know, we, we, um, we haven't been able to mobilize as a country the, the resources that people need in order to provide care in an emergency. Um, and that's kind of frustrating. And we're not alone. I mean, we're, we're doing this here for Providence St. Joseph Health. I know colleagues that I've been in contact with on the East Coast are trying to do this for other places in the country as well. What a sign of the times, huh? It's very true. All right, thank you. And keep up the good work. You're doing good work here, all of you. So can you help me understand, just looking at Washington, as you've described, what are some of the lessons that the rest of the country can take away from, you know, essentially how they've managed the crisis so far? Well, I think you have to be innovative and be resilient. Uh, we were with the, the chief financial officer of the um, Providence Healthcare uh, System, and uh, she you know, was doing her, her morning uh, call, 7.30 call with her top people, uh, trying to, you know, figure out how to manage their way through it. Again, the big concern, not just the, the PPE, the, the protection equipment, but also the looming concern, which we've heard a little bit about, is the ventilators. You know, what do you do about ventilators? Her question to her team was, how can we hack ventilators? So when I finally got my turn to talk to her after the call, I said, well, this is, kind of reminds me of that scene in Apollo 13 when they're trying to get the back and they, they throw all the, the, the eight pieces of gear they have up there and how, how can we make a, a carbon dioxide scrubber out of this, right? And she said, it's just like that. We're going in our basement. We're trying to figure this out. And I said, well, wait a minute. How do you get... FDA approval for a gadget like that. She said, if you're dying, do you care if there's FDA approval? And I said, no, I'd probably take you pumping a bellows into me. I don't know. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it, it, that's the kind of thinking that is going to get us through this, frankly, because we are, we are on our heels. The, we don't have the equipment. We don't have the gear. And that, that level of resilience is so important. I think that's the, that's the number one lesson I think that we have to take away from this is that, you know, waiting on the federal government, that's not going to necessarily work. Um, rising to the occasion individually is important. I mean, we still need collective action, national action, global action. That, that, that's not to discount that. But waiting for it uh, is, is, in her view, not an option. Miles, tell me a little bit about why you feel it's so important to be there on the ground right now. I really do feel the lessons that have come out of here, where it, where it began, where it remains an epicenter of the disease, the lessons here are crucial. And we really need to pay attention to what they've done and what they've learned here. And, you know, the calls are coming in from all over the nation, uh, from the healthcare system. They knew that this was likely to happen. They made a plan, they've executed a plan, and now they're learning the plan works, but also how to modify it going forward. And so I just think that's, that's such an important story to tell right now. Miles, such a terrific conversation, and I know it's been really hard to fit in even more conversations with us um, back in Boston, but we really appreciate it. Miles O'Brien, thank you so much again for chatting with us today, and we'll be talking throughout your time in Seattle and also when you come back to the East Coast. You're welcome, Rainy. With our days now being consumed by rising numbers of cases, closings, and uncertainty, it can be easy to lose our bearings as things change so quickly. We're going to be bringing you more dispatches like this one as the pandemic unfolds. This podcast was produced by Max Green and James Edwards with help from Colin Steffens. Sarah Childress is our senior editor and Andrew Metz is our managing editor. The Frontline Dispatch is produced at WGBH and powered by PRX.
Stay tuned for more in our Covering Coronavirus series.